Welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm your host, Dame Lillian Walker. Today we are continuing with chapter three in breaking the habit of becoming yourself. So let's dive in deep. We left off yesterday on page 80. Can elevated states of mind produce healthier expression of genes? So here's an example of how we can signal new genes in new ways when we begin to emotionally embrace an event in the future before it's made manifest. In Japan, a study was conducted to find out what effect one state of mind might have on disease. The subjects were two groups of patients with type 2 diabetes, all of whom were dependent on insulin. Keep in mind that most diabetics medicate with insulin to remove sugar, glucose, out of the bloodstream and deposit in the cells where it can be used for energy. At the time of this study, the people involved were being treated with insulin pills or injections to help control their elevated blood sugar levels. Each group had their fasting blood sugar level tested to establish a baseline. Next, one set of subjects watched a comedy show for an hour while the control group being watched, watched a boring lecture. The test subjects then ate a delicious meal, after which their blood glucose levels were checked again. There was a significant discrepancy between the subjects who enjoyed the comedy show and those who viewed the uneventful lecture. On average, those who watched the lecture had their blood sugar levels rise 123 milligrams per DL high enough that they would need to take insulin to keep themselves out of the danger zone. In the joyful group who had laughed for one hour, their after dinner blood sugar levels rose about half that amount, slightly out of the normal range. Initially, the researchers who performed the experiment thought that the lighthearted subjects had lowered their sugar levels by contracting their abdominal and diaphragm muscles when they laughed. They reasoned that when a muscle contracts, it uses energy and in circulating energy is glucose. But the research went further. They examined the gene sequence of the jovial individuals and discovered that these diabetics had altered 23 different gene expressions just by laughing at the comedy show they'd seen. Their elevated state of mind apparently triggered their brains to send new signals to their cells, which turned on the genetic variations that allowed their bodies to naturally begin to regulate the genes responsible for processing blood sugar. Pause button. Oh my gosh, this makes me think of all sorts of different things right now because there's a lot of people in the world right now that due to the current global status because this this live stream today is being done during the quarantine for covid some of you are going to be watching this well after the quarantine is over but at this moment in time there is a quarantine on most places throughout the world and very few places have opened up so a lot of people have been required to stay in their homes now one of the things that i have repeatedly done throughout this whole quarantine period is post a list of funny movies that you can watch. I think the list I have, I think it's 50 different films that I've actually watched, all of which are very funny, very good feeling films, because a lot of people are out there looking for funny films to watch because they know that they're going to feel better when they do this. But I personally know that your body is all chemistry, no matter what you're doing. You breathe in chemistry, which alters the chemical makeup of your body. As you exhale, that's another process. You're taking in things through your eyes. Believe it or not, when you look at the color red, as opposed to the color green, you have a different chemical reaction inside your body in response to looking at a, let's say a white board versus a green board versus a red board versus a blue board. Your chemistry actually is different. 
And so in recognition of that, everything I've been a very keenly aware for the majority of my adult life that everything is chemistry, whether you put it on your skin, whether you take it in orally, you know, whether it's food or any other kind of chemical that you take orally, whether you're injecting it, let's say you're getting medicine, you know, through an IV at the doctor's office or in the hospital, everything is chemistry. Shampoo that you put on your hair, anything and everything that your body comes in contact with, which is everything from your environment, the water that comes through your plumbing, believe it or not. Um, not all water that comes through our plumbing here in the United States is actually safe and healthy. You know, let's not get into that big discussion, but there's all sorts of things that um, are not exactly the healthiest for you, which is why most of us drink bottled water or we buy spring water or what have you, or have filters, or we do both and. So everything is chemistry. And this study here is pointing a finger towards that. You know, you have a group of diabetics, all of whom have to take insulin to regulate their sugar. And one group is watching a boring lecture. And then the other one gets to watch a funny movie. So they get to laugh for, you know, the duration of this experiment. We're, we're gonna say it's an hour because I think that's what it said here. And not surprising, the ones who were subjected to watching the funny movies, not only, of course, you're contracting your muscles when you're laughing, and then, you know, the more you contract your muscles, the more lactic acid you have building up, which ultimately the lactic acid then, if you do that enough, then the lactic acid really starts to build up on your muscles. Yeah. If you have enough of that, it can cause sore muscles because you've overexerted the muscle, which isn't a bad thing. It's breaking down some of the muscle microscopic level to create tiny little um, scar tissue, which is going to make that muscle bigger and stronger so that you have more endurance the next time around. So the bottom line is that it triggered for them to have a positive response in comparison to the other group that had a boring lecture. And so what is that, what is that saying to you and to me is that these things make a difference. So right now, at this moment in time, you have chosen to invest time in yourself. You've, been, you've chosen to make yourself smarter instead of going with your normal MO and firing off 1300 neural synapses in your brain and firing and wiring what you always have fired and wired. You have chosen to learn something new, breaking the habit of becoming yourself by Dr. Joe Dispenza. You've learned to immerse yourself in this study become acquainted with this information to not only watch this video, but also to read it, to hear it, to see it, to experiencing it by doing it. Now you have 2,600 neuro, you know, neural pathways of the brain that are firing and wiring, and you have neural synapses, double the amount of what's your habit. So you're actually becoming more intelligent because you're choosing to engage and immerse yourself in this particular experience. And one of the things that you can do after you get off of this video is you can jump on and watch a funny movie. Now, there's a couple things that you're doing unbeknownst to you when you do that. You're anchoring this information with that funny positive experience, which is a feel good experience. You're gonna naturally increase the oxytocin, which is a feel good hormone. You're gonna, you're, the endorphins that are created in your body. Again, it's a chemical reaction to laughter to that which is funny. You're choosing to put yourself in a trans state. Anytime you watch a movie, you do that, by the way. Anytime you watch anything on TV, you're putting yourself into a kind of a hypnotic trans state unbeknownst to you. So now if you're watching a funny movie, you are wiring and firing and encouraging the neural synapses of laughter, of joy, of an elevated emotion. That's your choosing. You're subjecting yourself on purpose to that. So that's going to put you in a positive state. It's a great way to end the evening. You're listening to this. I'm assuming that you're watching this in the evening because I started this at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Then you watch a funny movie. Then you go to sleep. Imagine the awesome dreams you're going to have after that, especially as, as you put your head you know, on your pillow, you decide to do maybe a 15-minute meditation, or maybe you decide to do one of Dr. Joe's 
like breaking um, breaking the habit of becoming yourself. There's two meditations that come in that those MP3s when you go to his website. You get the body parts meditation and you get the rising water meditation. Either one. If you choose to do that before you go to sleep, and I know some of you are thinking, oh, gee whiz, Lillian, you know, this broadcast is over an hour. And on top of that, then we're going to watch, let's say, okay, from 9 to 10.30, let's say. 10.30 to 11.30, 12. Now it's 12 o'clock. And now to do a meditation at 12 o'clock, oh my gosh, it's going to be 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning before I'm done. Yeah, it may be. But make no mistakes. When you do that meditation, that is part of your restorative sleep. You are not taking away. That was like the biggest ahas for me when I started meditating using Dr. Joe's meditations because I'm not one that takes a lot of sleep at any given time. But I started realizing one of the things why I felt so refreshed all the time was because I was doing these meditations every morning and every night. And by doing the meditations, I didn't realize how nourishing that was to my body. Not only am I putting myself in a deep trance, I'm getting heart. Think about that. You're getting heart and brain coherence. Okay. You're doing that on purpose. That is a gift that you are giving yourself. Maybe the rest of the day you've been out of heart and brain coherence, but now you're sealing the end of your day, getting into heart and brain coherence. So your heart and your brain now are coherent. Your eight energy centers are, are open and you're connecting the energy from the base of your perineum to your heart, to your, to your pineal gland. You are restoring the balance of your body. You're linking and syncing the left and the right hand side of your brain because you can't do that and not have that as an end result. The induction that he puts you through when you're focusing let's say on your heart inside your body and the space that your heart occupies inside the body. And then you are focusing on that same heart being in space all around you. And then doing the same thing with the other energy centers and doing that with your head or whatever body parts he's calling your attention to. That is creating an inductance feel, induction. We talked about that in breaking we're going to talk about it in breaking the habit of becoming yourself, but he goes into it at great extent. I believe it's in chapter eight or nine. He talks about the electromagnetic frequency and the field of induction that you create and the benefit to you of creating that induction field and make no mistakes. Another thing that you're doing is that you're getting out of a body that is dense and heavy. And, if, and instead of feeling that heaviness, you are now becoming more of a light body. And instead of all of your body becoming matter, because you're connecting your heart and your brain, you are in 5D aware that you're one with the one, that you are the one. And because you're in that 5D quantum realm, you are actually paying attention at the subatomic level. You're noticing the potential waveforms of energy. It's potential energy waveforms. And so as you fan out your electromagnetic field, also known as your torus, T-O-R-U-S, or your toroidal field, as you're fanning it out, you're becoming less dense. There's actually more light through every cell of your body, head to toe and beyond, even, you know, fanned out. Gosh, I'm noticing that the light is flashing between orange and... Now that I'm paying attention to it, of course it stops. So there's an energy thing kind of going on here. Okay, I got it. So anyhow, so I want you to understand these things because these are things that if I don't stop and point them out to you here, they'll go unnoticed. And the whole objective of my reviewing this book with you and sharing these insights is so that you get more juice out of the orange that we're squeezing. Make no mistakes, this book is like a juicy orange. And instead of just getting like one cup of orange juice out of it, you're going to get three cups of orange juice out of it. Only reason why is because I'm a little farther along. I'm no better than you, no worse than you. 
I just happen to be familiar already with this information. I happen to be an advanced student of Dr. Joe's. I happen to have been connected for now over a year with a community of other advanced students and fellow mystics who we apply, we try, we adjust. We are doing coherence healings all the time. We are very dedicated and fervent about not just meditating, it's not just like a religious thing. This, is, this has nothing to do with religion. This is a practice that we do to embrace as trite or trivial as this may sound, but it really is embracing the relationship that we have with ourselves, being the truest part of ourselves, embracing unconditional love and broadcasting that unconditional love, not just for the benefit of ourselves, but because we all now have not just a recognition, we have a, know, a knowingness. We realize, we understand, we comprehend, we, we embrace the fact and we know at a much deeper level that we are connected not only to our fellow brothers and sisters who are also fellow mystics, but we are connected to not only the divine, but all the beings on this planet in all of its forms. And as we choose to embrace love and say, no, the feelings of unworthiness, of less than, of falling short, of nervousness, of angst, of worry, of doubt, I'm not doing this right, I'm not good enough, everybody else is, all that negative monkey mind chatter. We've learned to put that aside. That doesn't mean that it likes, you know, that it will never rear its ugly head again. Oh, it will. But we go, we recognize it now. We're like, oh, no, I'm on to you. No, remember, I'm the master. You're the servant brain and ego. You're not my amigo anymore. You're my enemigo. You're just there for contrast. You're there to signal me and bring my light to awareness because the darkness of this thought is so dark that it makes me shine brighter. I'm going, oh, that's how I used to be. That's how I used, those used to be what I thought were my thoughts. Those are not my thoughts. That's old past programming. That's my old personality. I have a new personality that's creating my own personal reality with intention on purpose. I embrace love, not fear. Fear, you don't own me. You have no more a part in my history. It may have been there in my history, but I choose to now frame it in a different way. So now I take the jewels of wisdom from that fear that used to be there. And it's not a mystery anymore why that was there. And thank goodness, because that really was an act of the divine showing me an aspect of love, of how I needed to love myself unconditionally. If I can't love myself unconditionally, how on God's green earth, no pun intended, how am I going to love somebody else unconditionally? It's more challenging. And for some of us, that is easier than others because some, some people tend to be more jaded and more cynical. And then other people tend not to be more jaded and more cynical. Everybody has a cross to bear in this journey as we experience life on this planet. Everybody. So everybody has a different issue to work with. Most of, most of us have multiple issues to work with. And that's fine. That's part of the fabric of life and it's part of what makes us unique. It's part of our, I wanna say it's part of our destiny and part of those challenges are the actual jewels that make us relatable to other people because other people are struggling with some of the same things we're never completely alone in that in that experience and when we're able to overcome them and we're able to be transparent enough to share them with others then others see that there's a promise that they can do that too i'm not going to say just a hope because like dr joe says i'll never forget the first time i heard him say that in the monastery he said hope is a beggar and the moment he said that it resonated with me and i thought Hope is a beggar, it's so true, because I, I feel the, sh the lack. When I say, oh, I hope, that means you're like grasping, hoping, you're like pleading, praying that please, I hope, nah, forget that. That's 
not part of what I want. I am going to embrace the loving aspect of me where I know that when I put my order in, it is done. Finito, as we say in Italy. It fin in, in Spanish. Done. Le fin, como dicen in, in the, the way they say in France. So let's dive in deep and find out what happens with this group of people. Our emotions can turn some gene sequences and turn off others. This study clearly showed just by signaling the body with a new emotion, the laughing subjects altered their internal chemistry to change the expression of their genes. So sometimes a change in genetic expression can be sudden and dramatic. Have you ever heard people after being subjected to extremely stressful conditions whose hair turned gray overnight? I'm gonna hit a pause button here. I have a personal experience with this because my dad's oldest twin, my dad, there's four twins, and his oldest twin sibling, his sister, when her firstborn child was six years old and she had two younger children at the time, her young, her firstborn, Stanley, came, became diagnosed with leukemia. And she was fairly young at the time when this happened. And needless to say, this was, this was, I think, 50, must have been like 55, 60 years ago, something like that. Long story short, this is my oldest, the absolute oldest cousin that I have, so he's much older than I am. Long story short, um, he ended up coming down with leukemia, and despite all their efforts, all the treatments that they sought out for him, he didn't make it. So when he was six, he passed away. And my adorable, cute little aunt, her name was Nabi, um, her... She had long black hair down to her waist. And when this horrible trauma took place, as you can only imagine, it devastated her, completely floored her. And even though she was fairly young, I really don't know how old she was at the time, but my guess would be 30 perhaps. So when he passed away, even though she was still young, her hair turned white and she looked like my grandmother's sister, even though my grandmother was probably like 24, 25, 26 years older than her. She looked like my grandmother's sister. She didn't look like my grandmother's daughter. And then she remained that way for several decades. And it wasn't until, I want to say I was, I was in high school and she came out here to California to visit us. And she not only had cut her hair shoulder length, but she had dyed her hair dark again. And oh my gosh, she took 20 years off of herself. She's petite, she's kind of built like I am. And it was amazing to see her because my whole life she had looked like my grandmother's sister with the long, she always had long gray hair. And now all of a sudden she had this short, cute hair and it was dark and she probably looked like she was 40 years old. And I don't know how old she was when I was in high school, but I don't know. She must have been in her 60s is my guess. I don't know. I'll have to ask my dad. But it was incredible to see how young she looked. And then she had a smile on her face. But she suffered from a great depression because of the stress of having lost that child so young. And it was such a horrific experience. And so I'm, I'm sure there's somebody out there who's watching this video right now who is going, yeah, that happened to me. You know, I had X, Y, Z happen. And it was such a shock to your system that your hair went gray. And it's okay. But that trauma can be released. And in fact, I would love to encourage you to check out, I have a three minute neuro health reset. If you want to just do that three minute health reset, go through that. You can do that by yourself. You don't need me to, to guide you through that. You can just listen to that YouTube video it's just a little shy of three minutes long. That should get rid of that trauma. If there's lessons that you need to learn from that trauma, it could be that if you have a pain level of eight, nine, or 10, and maybe it doesn't want to get below a one, there could be things that your subconscious is not allowing you to completely release because it wants to retain that wisdom. Then there's another, there's something that we can, there's another process. It's another neurosomatic process that we can walk you through that will retain the lessons so that you garnish the wisdom and then let go of the trigger of the trauma. 
so that that emotional pain body is basically dissolved instantly. So that's something that you might want to look into. I also have a Facebook live video, which I will put into my YouTube channel very shortly so that you hear the whole explanation as to how it is that this works, because this doesn't, it's not predicated based on belief. But doing these particular meditations and this process that Dr. Joe tells us, this is a practice like brushing your teeth that once you start it, you're going to want to do this for the rest of your life. Why? Because it feels good, because you're constantly firing and rewiring the different aspects of your brain. You're centering your, all of the energy centers and all the consciousness in your body, all the cells, all of your energy centers. You are now connected to the divine. You are now knowing how to mold the clay in 5D quantum. So they're just like brushing your teeth. Why would you ever skip a day? You know, you're, some of us, we brush our teeth in the morning and we brush our teeth at night. It's not enough to just brush our teeth either or morning or evening. And meditation, this practice is no different. You're going to want to meditate in the morning. You're going to want to meditate at night. There are times during the middle of the day that you might do shorter aspects of meditation. You might do a walking meditation in the face of something unwanted or in the recognition that there's something that you would like to bring in that's like fun and exciting. And it would be just, you know, it would be fun just to manifest, I don't know, a Starbucks or or whatever, whatever you're fancying, just because it's like, ooh, let me try that, you know, let me manifest a whatever. And so then you might do a brief meditation to do that. That doesn't mean that it has to take you an hour. And there's no such thing as a bad meditation, as Dr. Joe says. It's so, so true. The more you do this, the more you realize that no experience is wasted. Every meditation, even the meditations you think that nothing is happening, Wait till you find out when you come to that point in time and you go, oh, all those meditations, I thought they were kind of flat, that they were like non-eventful, like nothing was happening. Oh, there's stuff happening, especially if, if, if you just walk away with a great sense of peace and love and centeredness, but you don't see, feel, sense anything spectacular. You don't see any ge geometrical patterns of, of, uh, you know, packets of information. You don't have anything that you perceive to be a mystical experience. It will be revealed to you. It will be revealed to you is all I'm going to say. Okay. Jumping back into the book. So we just left off where her hair turned gray overnight. So that's an example of genes at work. They experience such a strong emotional reaction that their altered body chemistry both turned on the gene for the expression of gray hair and shut off the genetic expression for their normal hair color. Within a matter of hours, they signaled new genes in new ways by emotionally and thus chemically altering their internal environment. So as I discussed in the last chapter, when you've experienced an event numerous times by mentally rehearsing every aspect of it in your mind, you feel that what event would feel like, yeah, so you're, you're rehearsing every aspect of it in your mind, you feel what that event would feel like before it unfolds. Then as you change the circuitry in your brain by thinking in new ways and you embrace the emotions of an event ahead of its physical manifestation, it's possible that you can change your body genetically. Can you pick a potential from the quantum field? Every potential already exists, by the way, and emotionally embrace a future event before the actual experience. Can you do this so many times that you emotionally condition the body to a new mind? thus signaling new genes in new ways? If you can, it is highly possible that you will begin to shape and mold your brain and body into a new expression so that they physically change before the desired potential reality is made manifest. So changing your body, why lift a finger? We may believe that we can change our brains by thinking, but what effects, if any, will this have on the body? 
Through the simple process of mentally rehearsing an activity, we can derive great benefit without lifting a finger. Here's an example of how that literally happened. As described in an article published in 1992, Journal of Neurophysiology, subjects were divided into three groups. The first group was asked to exercise by contracting and relaxing one finger of their left hand. For five one hour training sessions per week for four weeks. The second group mentally rehearsed the same exercise on the same timetable without physically activating the muscles of the finger. People in a control group exercise neither their fingers nor their minds. So at the end of the study, the scientists compared the findings. The first set of participants had their finger strength tested against the control group. A no brainer, right? The group who did the actual exercises exhibited 30% greater finger strength than those in the control group. We all know that if we repeatedly put a load on a muscle, we will increase the strength of that muscle. What we probably wouldn't anticipate is that the group who mentally rehearsed the exercises demonstrated a 22% increase in muscle strength. The mind then produced a quantifiable physical effect on the body. In other words, the body changed without having any actual physical experience, just as researchers have worked with test subjects who mentally rehearsed the finger exercises and others who imagined playing piano scales. Experiments have compared practical experience versus mental rehearsal for individuals doing bicep curls. The results were the same, whether the participants physically performed bicep curls or mentally rehearsed those activities, they all increased their bicep strength. The mental exercisers, though demonstrated physiological changes without ever having the physical experience. So when the body has changed physically, biologically to look like an experience has just happened, just by thought or mental efforts alone, then from a quantum perspective, this offers evidence that the event has already transpired in our reality. If the brain upgrades its hardware to look like experience physically occurred, and the body is changed genetically or biologically, it is showing evidence that it happened. And both are different without doing anything in three dimensions. Then the event has occurred both in the quantum world and the world of consciousness and in the world of physical reality. When you have thoughtfully rehearsed a future reality until your brain has physically changed to look like it has had the experience and you have emotionally embraced a new intention. So many times that your body is altered to reflect that it has had the experience. Hang on, because this is the moment the event finds you and it will arrive in a way that you least expect, which leaves no doubt that it came from your relationship to a greater consciousness so that it inspires you to do it again and again and again. My friends and gems, that's the end of chapter three. So just imagine what if you were to do both and. So instead of just, let's say, let's say you're doing the plank. And maybe right now when you go to do the plank, maybe you can only hold the plank for three minutes. And let's say that you, that's where I do my plank, by the way. So in the morning, you get up, you go to do the plank. And maybe when you first start off, you're like, gee whiz, I can only do three minutes. Maybe you can only do two minutes. And when you start off, you're like, gosh, it would be so cool to get to four minutes. And wow, I could probably never get to five, but that would be awesome if I could go from two to four. I mean, I'm doubling the amount of time that I'm doing the plank and wouldn't that be cool? 
And so now you decide every morning I am going to do the plank for two minutes and I'm going to add 15 seconds every day until I get to four minutes. And you start to do that. So maybe in addition to doing the plank physically every morning, you decide, you know what? When I'm having lunch, I'm gonna think mentally of myself doing the plank for four minutes. So now in addition to physically doing it, and now you're mentally doing it, do you see how you can compound exponentially the results that you're having from doing the plank physically and mentally? Because you saw in the research, it showed that the participants who just did it in quantum, did it mentally, had a 30% increase in finger strength. Can you imagine if you had a 30% increase in your core strength from doing the plank physically, and now it's 30% just from you rehearsing it at lunchtime or whenever mentally. Incredible, isn't it? I think on that note, we will end. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in, tapping in, turning on to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lee Walker. Please use the comments below for us to have this open classroom so that we can discuss whatever it is that your hearts desire. And last but not least, thank you for those of you who have liked, subscribed, and shared this channel. And for those of you who have decided to donate, thank you, thank you, thank you. And that is all for Love and Money Secrets TV. Ciao for now.